um, had the privilege of walking in the Midland Memorial Day Parade, the Sanford Memorial Day Parade. My wife and I had dinner Friday night out at the Sanford American Legion Post as uh, Fred Post, their uh, commander just retired as commander, he finished up four years in that position. And uh, then on Saturday went to the Sanford uh, Centennial Museum for a, a veterans memorial there. And then on uh, Sunday went to church, Monday um, went uh, both to the Midland and Sanford parades and had a couple of opportunities to, to speak uh, at the band shell in Midland after the parade. I spoke in front of the Dow High School band and I started off, John, by asking for a show of hands as to how many of those kids were 17. Most of them raised their, their hands and the reason I asked that was because I then shared with them the story of taking my father back to Pearl Harbor where he had served uh, at age 19 when it was attacked by the Japanese and that one of the things we had done when I had my father at Pearl Harbor was find his best friend's grave. A uh, young man from Oklahoma that he'd become friends with in basic training and uh, the thing that jumped out at me about Robert Peake's gravestone when I did the math is he was exactly 17 and a half years old. He'd been born on June 7th so he was 17 and a half years old when he died uh, on December 7th. Uh, it's difficult for me to look at 17 year olds and imagine that those were the people but they are in fact among those who uh, have died in past wars to defend our freedom. Uh, we all have family memories of, uh, of members of our family who served and it's because we have those memories that we have a free country because so many Americans have sacrificed and given their lives. Also got to speak and lay a wreath at both the Midland Veterans uh, Memorial downtown and also out at the Sanford Memorial. So uh, watched Saving Private Ryan, which is uh, not an easy movie to watch, but nonetheless one of my favorite movies anytime I need to be reminded. Uh, my wife asked me, John, this morning, what was the best thing to say to me as I left for Lansing each week? And fresh off having watched Private Ryan again, I said to her, just say, Gary earned this. And that was one of the points I made in my talk, is that uh, we all, I think, have, should have be burdened and, and feel a sense of duty in our hearts to live our lives in such a way that we not only appreciate the freedom that other people gave their lives for, but that we earn that sacrifice, that we do the best with our lives, uh, so that we are, are worthy of the sacrifices that have been made for us through so many, many generations. I, I've gone on Ancestry.com, John, for me and my family, it goes all the way back to Stephen Cash, who was with Colonel Washington's regiment in the French and Indian War, um, and five great-great-grandfathers in the Civil War, uh, grandfather in World War I, father a Marine in World War II. Um, I went Army during the uh, Persian Gulf War. Uh, Army Reserves and National Guard, but anyway, all our families have people who've served our country, and that's what Memorial Day is all about, to remember those who've given us everything that we have, everything that we are. And you know, that's key too, you know, Lincoln at Gettysburg talked about being dedicated to those who gave their lives that that nation might live. Yep. That's the bottom line, isn't it? Yep, and uh, included in that history that I've noted, uh, he made reference to this nation under God. And uh, I have often noted after being asked to say the Pledge of Allegiance that those of us in Michigan ought to take some particular pride of authorship in the phrase under God in the Pledge of Allegiance because it was a Republican U.S. Senator and a Democratic Congressman both from Wayne County who introduced the legislation in 1952 to add the words under God to our Pledge of Allegiance which we say on the House floor every day and just so happens that Representative Tom Barrett of Lansing, who was a Republican, it was his great-grandfather who was the Democrat congressman from Wayne County who was the co-sponsor of that, uh, along with a Republican senator, of that legislation that President Eisenhower signed into law back in 1952. And the phrase, under God, uh, according to the testimony of those introduced it, came from Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom. And uh, Memorial Day is a great day to be reminded uh, of our heritage and the sacrifice that people have made. I, you know, I uh, had always held the military in high regard. My father was a, a Marine who survived Pearl Harbor, so I grew up being taught to love my country. But I, 
I did not appreciate the sacrifice that every member of our military makes just in terms of separation from their family. Whether it's a 17 or 18 year old being away for the first time from mom and dad, or in my case when I enlisted, a wife and two children that I already had, uh, it was only at having served that I developed the appreciation of just the, the price. You know, we all know you can be killed or injured, but the sacrifice that every member of our military makes, including National Guard and, and Reserves, the separation from family is a major sacrifice, even if you come out without a scratch. Uh, my dad and his brother both came out of World War II without injury. Uh, but certainly faced hazard and uh, I am certainly grateful to members of my family and to all those who served our military. I'm proud to be on the Military and Veterans Affairs Committee and Midland County uh, in the past has certainly been privileged in that respect because Senator John Molinar at the time and Representative Jim Stamus were both chairman of their respective houses Veterans Affairs Committee. Uh, John's gone on to be our congressman and Jim is now our state senator, but now I'm the only elected official who's on a military and veterans affairs committee, either at the state or federal level. And uh, that, that's a passion of the heart. And uh, I've co-sponsored legislation to do our best to be true to the, to the pledge we make to our veterans. Legislation to make sure that they get the appropriate course credit at Michigan universities and colleges for their military training so that they're aware that that credit is available to them. Uh, we have legislation that says that uh, in terms of uh, custody battles with children that you can't make a change in the custody arrangement if one of the one of the parents is deployed as was the case here in Michigan with one case where one of the parents was on a mil on a submarine navy submarine and unavailable for 6 months so unless the child is in imminent danger um, you cannot change the custody agreements if one of the parents is deployed uh, and also some legislation to ensure that that uh, totally disabled veterans who are renters instead of owners of a home, that they get the same type of tax treatment as we gave in past sessions to uh, disabled veterans, 100% disabled veterans who own a home, some tax breaks, and we're calculating uh, through this legislation the same thing for a veteran who, uh, who simply rents the, the, the place where they live. But what I can tell you, John, about the Military and Veterans Affairs Committee, I think each member is a veteran. But best I can recall, all the votes have been unanimous. There, there is no partisan line uh, in the uh, Military and Veterans Affairs Committee. We just do our best to do what's best for veterans, regardless of their background or their political affiliation. Anybody who served our country, given us everything that we have. Representative, in a similar vein, we have Flag Day coming up on June 14th. So that's not too far away. And obviously, flying your flag on Flag Day is a, a simple but at the same time very significant thing well, to do. Well certainly I encourage uh, everybody who watches to, to fly their flag. If they don't have one, go buy one. Um, I'm one of those guys who's always flown the flag. It's up, it's up every day. Um, and I remember after 9-11 there were a lot of flags up. So it shouldn't take some type of national tragedy to remind us of our pride as a nation what makes us what makes America a special place to live when you look at what's happening around the country where excuse me around the world where individuals are persecuted for their faith in some cases as we've had to watch on television their heads are cut off because of their faith um, the same faith that, that a lot of us here in America share uh, we need to be ever mindful of how privileged, how blessed we are to live in the United States of America and, be, and do our duty, whatever our duty uh, is individually, to help protect the freedoms that we have in this country. We are so blessed. We should support our veterans and those who serve in our military now to help keep us free because absent America's stabilizing force in the world and the strength of the United States military, there but by the grace of God go any of us uh, what's special about America is our commitment to liberty and our commitment to being strong enough, as Ronald Reagan said, peace through strength, to being strong enough to protect it. Uh, because absent those, the, the commitment to those principles, we could just as easily have been a part of the world that is subject to the same type of persecution and violation of individual freedoms and rights as we witness, unfortunately, on our televisions, uh, and may someday be as Re again, as President Reagan said, we're never more than one generation away from losing the liberty for which our forefathers and, and those who, all those who came before us fought. So uh, 
that sense of duty is what frankly drove me to run for elective office and having just come fresh off Memorial Day I obviously have that on my heart and mind today and and uh, so certainly assure our listeners uh, and viewers that when I'm casting a vote and doing my best I'm, I'm doing my best to earn it to earn the uh, the privilege and the blessing of living in a free country and also the responsibility of representing 90,000 uh, residents of Bay and Midland counties here in the legislature. I'm one of only 110 people who get to, in the House of Representatives, propose the laws under which we all have to live. That is a, uh, a solemn duty and a, and a, a weighty duty, uh, but it is a, I am motivated by the desire to be able to pass on to my children and grandchildren what I inherited from my father and, and those who came before him, and that is a free country where our rights are respected. Uh, and we keep our, our country and our, our, our citizens and families not just free, but safe and secure. Representative, we've talked in the past about your civil asset forfeiture legislation. That legislation, and it's part of a package of bills, was actually up in committee today for debate. What happened? Well, it was passed out of committee, so it now goes to the full House of Representatives, and I think its prospects are good. Uh, it really has no effect on what our law enforcement officers do when there is crime in the process of being committed or when there is reasonable uh, basis on which to suspect crime is committed. Then in some cases, drug dealers, for example, uh, their property will be seized. If a car is being used in the commission of a crime, the property can be seized. And we do not want to in any way detract from our police officers' ability to do their job, uh, including stopping the property from being further used in the commission of a crime. But where the motivation for the reform comes is for people who are not convicted of a crime and may never even be charged with a crime. Uh, one of the most outrageous examples was a fundraiser for the Detroit Institute of Arts where apparently they were selling alcohol without a license and police raided the fundraiser and then seized the vehicles, the cars, uh, of all the people who came and unknowingly attended. Had nothing whatsoever to do with the uh, alleged crime at the fundraiser of selling alcohol without a license, and yet found their cars seized. We heard testimony uh, during that committee this morning uh, from a woman uh, who had whose uh, property, her home, had been in. in uh, had been raided by law enforcement and uh, property, her computers, her cell phones were taken and then she was never even charged with a crime and yet all of that property was held by law enforcement. So the bills don't affect what police officers do in seizing property, that's one issue, but the forfeiture it, it would affect and put limits on what prosecutors would, able, would be able to do we don't go so far as, for example, North Carolina or New Mexico to say that there must be a conviction in order to have any type of forfeiture at all. But we do, uh, in this legislation that I've introduced, raise the burden of proof from preponderance of the evidence to clear and convincing evidence that some type of property, cash or vehicle or boat or home, is being used in the commission of a crime. So we're out to protect the rights of law-abiding citizens who find themselves in a situation of having been raided, their property seized. We're the only state in the country that, ha that requires somebody to pay a 10% bond, 10% of the value of the property seized, to even be able to go to court and challenge the seizure of their, of their property. So there's going to be separate legislation to do away with that. This is an issue uh, in which you have perhaps a strange bedfellows coalition. The American Civil Liberties Union, the ACLU, with whom I don't agree very often, and the Mackinac Center for Public Policy, with whom I regularly agree, uh, and the Institute for Justice uh, have come together in, in support of the principle that if property is being used in the commission of a crime, then it's subject to, to forfeiture. But we're looking to protect the rights of law-abiding citizens who may not ever even be charged with a crime, have nothing to do with a crime, but may face the forfeiture of their property. And in some cases, uh, if, you, if you have a car that's old enough, the value of the car may exceed what it would cost you to get a lawyer to go to court, and in a large percentage of the cases, apparently, people whose property is seized just let it go. 
uh, it, when they had nothing to do with any criminal activity. So we're attempting to protect the rights of law-abiding citizens, and, and that bill uh, that I authored as part of a package that is being promoted by Speaker of the House Kevin Cotter, my seatmate up in Midland County, uh, will go to the floor now. I think its prospects are good uh, to protect the rights of law-abiding citizens, and, and hopefully we'll, we'll see uh, positive prospects in the Senate and hopefully win the governor's signature. Representative, we're going to take a quick break okay. right now, but we'll be back with Representative Gary Glenn reports right after this. And we're back with Representative Gary Glenn reports. Representative, it's a busy time in Lansing right now dealing with roads. In fact, there is a new House committee, the House Committee on Roads and Economic Development, that is vetting a series of bills right now, including uh, a couple today which would reprioritize the money from the Michigan Economic Development Corporation over in two roads. So a lot is going on. Yeah, that issue is near the top of the list of uh, any anything we're going to be discussing here recently. Uh, I oppose Proposal 1. Eighty-five percent of the voters in my legislative district voted no on Proposal 1. I got the message loud and clear. I think what voters were telling us is, we believe out of a $53 billion budget, you can find the money to allocate to what we claim to be a very high priority, and that is roads, public safety. Uh, without raising my taxes. Speaker Cotter, to his credit, has come up with a proposal that's a billion dollars in reallocated spending out of the money we already have in the budget. It only has a $45 million tax increase in it, and that has to do with adjusting the price of diesel and some type of fee for electrical cars that don't pay any gas at all, uh, gas tax at all. But uh, what that says to me, as someone who took a pledge not to raise taxes, is uh, you're, you can reallocate a billion dollars with only a $45 million tax increase. That tells me how close we are to being able to reallocate a billion dollars without raising taxes at all, which is the position that I'm going to take. And that doesn't even take into account the potential for spending cuts, like in the repeal of the prevailing wage, which we've talked about in the past, and other places in the budget, which I believe we could reduce spending further or eliminate spending. I think there are things that uh, the, the state spends money on that are questionable that we ought to spend anything at all. Uh, but uh, the House has taken the lead. We haven't sat back and waited on somebody else to make a proposal. Whatever the proposal is, it's not likely to be what it ends up being once it's been through the Senate and with the governor's uh, support. But uh, I believe that we have at least taken the lead on this issue, and hearings have already started, as you indicated, uh, by a special House committee appointed by Speaker Cotter. Uh, I'm going to help protect the Speaker from being buffeted and pressured only on one side uh, of the equation by the Senate and the Governor to raise even more taxes. I'm going to maintain the position that we ought to reallocate spending to roads as a priority without raising taxes at all so that the speaker is not pushed only on only one side of that issue. I think there are other members of the caucus who feel as I do that there is money there to fix our roads and bridges without raising taxes. And there are any number of proposals. One's on the table. We, we're still waiting to hear a proposal, I think, from the Senate, and we haven't seen anything from the governor. So the House is not waiting around on somebody else to take a leadership position. Our speaker has proposed a proposal. If somebody's got a better proposal, let's hear it. Um, Representative Lucido has a proposal about using the catastrophic uh, fund of $18, $19 billion and just the interest on that for a year or two to get the process jump started. And I certainly hope it does not take all the way through the summer to, to reach some type of resolution because we'd throw away an entire uh, an additional construction season. And I think we need, uh, obviously, to get our roads and bridges in the process of being repaired now. Uh, one thing appears certain is we're not going to pass the buck to the voters and take anything back to the voters and ask them to approve some type of new tax uh, or, or proposal. I believe the legislature sees its duty is to do it ourselves. And uh, that's my expectation. Uh, Representative, the roads debate is going you know, on a parallel course right now with discussions for the state's budget for 2016. Uh, a couple of times a year in Lansing at the Capitol, they have a revenue estimating conference where they do just that. They estimate state revenues, and the most recent one in early May spelled good news in terms of revenue, especially revenue that could be devoted to roads. Yep, could immediately be allocated to roads. Uh, the revenue projection is $366 million more 
than uh, we thought because of economic growth. Uh, Michigan, in its first full year as America's 24th right-to-work state, was number one in the nation in new manufacturing job creation, 25,000 new jobs created. That's going to mean income tax, sales tax revenue that we can project in the future. So the more our economy grows, the bigger the revenue projections will be. And uh, I, I expect that we're going to see continued growth, continued economic growth, because we're making decisions in the Republican-led legislature for the last six years that are now bearing fruit with economic recovery, uh, more so than the rest of the country. We had policies, frankly, under Governor Grenholm uh, and a different political environment that were responsible for Michigan lagging the rest of the country in terms of economic recovery. Well, now we're leading the economic recovery on the basis of new policies that have made Michigan more attractive to business and industry. Uh, and, and to go back to the uh, bill that you referenced a minute ago, the two bills that had a hearing just recently uh, by Representative Chatfield and who was? Uh, Representative Chatfield and Representative Patalia. Patalia. Uh, El Pina area. Uh, uh, about allocating money away from the Michigan Economic Development Corporation to fix our roads. You know, you, know, uh, you can debate whether or not the MEDC and its activities actually results in economic development. But if we have good roads and bridges, that's a very concrete, not, no pun intended, but a very concrete example to potential investors in Michigan who are concerned about the state of our infrastructure. Uh, you know, the ability to, to safely and efficiently and without damage to their vehicles move goods and products and, uh, across state lines, across our uh, interstate highway system and our state roads. So I believe that having good roads and bridges is a key element in being able to attract new business and industry. Uh, so I, I will be supportive of the legislation to take money that is used on the theory that the Mid Mid uh, Michigan Economic Development Corporation uh, is helping us attract new business and industry into something we know helps us attract new business and industry, and that's reliable infrastructure. Uh, uh, and uh, our budget that we have just uh, in the, are in the process of negotiating, we don't know yet, though apparently we have reached agreement. It's not been disclosed in detail yet. But the budget that the House produced actually reduced spending for the first time in four years in that money that we control. We had a 2% increase in the federal pass-through money over which the legislature doesn't have uh, unilateral control, which means that with a combination of our discretionary reduction in spending and the federal pass-through increase of 2%, we have a, a budget the House approved of only 1% increase, which is less than inflation. Uh, arguably a, a conservative budget by any standard. Does that mean everything in it I, I agree with? No. There would be places that I would pick and choose and say we could spend less or not at all. Uh, was able to get an amendment, uh, uh, be among those who supported an amendment to say, for example, that none of our state tax dollars will go to play, pay for abortions or to Planned Parenthood, the biggest provider of abortions in the country. But a conservative budget and uh, apparently the budget that is being negotiated with the Senate is coming out uh, in, in large part like the one we approved. So that's an encouragement. Hopefully the governor would sign that. Uh, but it's a, it's a big complex uh, pot of money and a lot of different uh, little pools that you have some control over and some you don't have control over. Uh, but I do believe it is a concern. It could be more conservative and I would support a more conservative budget. But uh, I can at least take some satisfaction that in that it is a conservative budget, surely by standards that we see in Washington, D.C., and in a lot of the other states around the country. Representative, on another topic, you're working on some legislation dealing with mass picketing here in Michigan. It's uh, an interesting topic. You were telling me that technically it is illegal, but there are... No penalties involved. What does your bill do? Yeah, I mean, and uh, I have introduced uh, several pieces of legislation. The civil forfeit, uh, civil asset forfeiture bill is not one that I came to the legislature at the top of my list. The uh, bill that's already passed the House to freeze the mega tax credits in place, that wasn't something I was thinking about as a candidate uh, for the legislature. And this mass picketing uh, legislation, again, is not something that was, you know, that I was conscious of. But it was uh, brought to me at the request of the Chamber of Commerce. Apparently it is illegal in Michigan already and has been for a long time to engage in mass picketing. So let me describe to you what that is. I did agree to introduce it. Uh, mass picketing, everybody has the First Amendment right to picket. But in the context of how mass picketing has been used, for example, uh, there was picketing at the governor's personal residence in Ann Arbor a few years ago. 
And one of the Democratic members of the House just a couple of weeks ago had their personal residence picketed. Well, that would be a violation of the mass picketing, for example, to be picketing at someone's personal place of residence. Another would be, uh, for example, some of these protests that have taken at, at McDonald's or other fast food locations. You have the right under the First Amendment to picket and to carry signs around to convey your message. But you don't, under state law, have the right to so totally surround a place of business with people, for example, to totally block the drive through uh, uh, at, at McDonald's so that the business cannot even conduct business. That's been illegal in Michigan for a long time, but there are no penalties, or at least I think it's a misdemeanor. And uh, what the chamber has asked for is legislation that would, would uh, for violation of this law, would be a $1,000 per individual fine and a $10,000 fine for any organization that either organized or sponsored the illegal activity, what's long been criminal activity. Uh, is going beyond the First Amendment right to picket and, and crossing the line to a point where you're actually preventing somebody from doing business or you're violating somebody's private property rights and safety and uh, security of, and peace of mind of their family at their home. It's already illegal. We're simply going to increase the penalties from misdemeanor to $1,000 per person, $10,000 for an organization that's responsible for it. Um, and uh, I think that'll go to the Commerce and Trade Committee which is uh, chaired by Representative Joe Graves. I'm a member of that. And uh, so we'll see how it fares in committee, but uh, the Chamber of Commerce, I think, is fairly influential uh, in Lansing. And so with their support, I hope we can get, get that legislation done as well. Finally, Representative, we're here in Lansing right now. You're generally in Lansing Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, obviously, That's right. though. That leaves four other days of the week when you're back home in the district. And I know you do spend and dedicate a lot of time to visiting and meeting with your constituents? I do, uh, and we've had very good reviews. Um, I'm attending a lot of township meetings, city councils, school boards, and have had members of those elected bodies tell me that they've seen me more than they've ever seen any uh, you know, state representative or legislator before. So that's certainly encouraging. I intend to continue to do that. As a candidate, I attended over 60 township and city council and school board type meetings. Um, and then uh, there was, I know, a Monday a, a few weeks ago where I was scheduled from 9 o'clock in the morning till 9 o'clock at night with meetings on the day that I'm in the district. And then on Fridays, uh, the first four Fridays uh, of each month, and uh, most months there are only four Fridays. If there's a fifth one, we don't have office hours scheduled. But uh, the first, second, third, and fourth Fridays of each month, we have office hours where I am available from noon to one in Midland, uh, in Sanford, in Pinconning, and in Auburn. And then we add one of the nearby townships from 1.30 to 2.30. And so uh, we continue to do that. I believe uh, by the time this is on the air, I will be uh, in Auburn at Auburn City Hall this coming Friday by the time this is on the air. But you might double check that schedule to make sure, depending on when you see this program. Um, but you can contact me at garyglenn at house.mi.gov at 1-855-GLEN-98 uh, is a toll-free phone number. Uh, RepGaryGlenn.com, R-E-P, GaryGlenn.com, a Facebook page. So lots of different ways that people can, can contact me to share with me their views on issues. Or just as important part of my job is to help uh, uh, residents of my district with any kind of problem they're having with state government. And we've had people attend our, our office hours and talk about individual personal problems that they have, not just to, to uh, bend my ear with their view on a particular issue. So those are both equally important parts of the job. Um, and uh, I'm doing my best, as my wife is now going to tell me when I leave uh, Midland for Lansing, to earn this duty and responsibility uh, to represent the people of Bay and Midland Counties. Gary Glenn, thank you very much. You bet. Thank you, John.